It's a real pleasure to welcome all of you here this morning. Uh, at this time, I'm going to ask uh, Tracy Thomas, who is the director of the library, to come in and welcome you all and uh, uh, dance, sing, or whatever else you would like to do, Tracy. But uh, it's early in the morning for that. Tracy Thomas, please. Thank y'all so much for coming this morning. I'm Tracy Thomas, the director here at the library. And you know, the Marble Festival is one of our most favorite times of the year. And the library enjoys so much getting to do the organizational support for this festival. And I have to say, you're very aware, you know, you've seen him out at the sculpting site, but you know that Dr. Ted Spears has been such a driving force behind this festival. And he works all year long to maintain these relationships with the quarries and with the sculptors. And so it's an all year project. It's not just a two week thing. So thank you, Dr. Ted, for all that you do. And it's, he does a great job. And I will say, too, it is a joy to work in a place like the Comer Library where you get to have so many different elements like beautiful artwork and beautiful sculptures and books. Uh, Dr. Shirley Spears our, was our director for 33 years, and she always said, I don't think the library should just be about books. I think we have a beautiful building, we have access to resources, and a visit to the library should be a cultural arts experience all the way around. And I think that under her leadership and her guidance all these years, we've been able to accomplish that. So we're very proud of the sculpture that we have in the building, the artwork that we have in the building, and of course the books as well. So, and she just came in, so we just got through talking about you, Dr. Spears. So, there she is. She <laughs> but again, thank you all so much, especially to the sculptors, for dedicating this time to come and spend this time in Sylacauga. If you're a visitor here, thank you for choosing to spend your day here in Sylacauga. We hope that you'll enjoy it. And again, Dr. Ted, thank you for everything. When we first started with the Marble Festival. We had a young man, uh, Frank Murphy, came over. Uh, I had heard of Frank. I had not met him, but he, he started. Uh, he, you know, he's important in the visual world. All sorts of beautiful paintings. He does uh, churches. He had done individual portraits. He had done religious themes. Uh, he had done a lot of things. But uh, he came over and and started in a strong way to do something that he did in his childhood, but he'll tell you about that. But Frank is a graduate of uh, Montevallo and then the, the Baptist Seminary at Louisville. He's also ordained minister. Most of you people know that. And uh, he's been the chaplain at Berry College and uh, one other institution there in Rome, Georgia for a number of years. But now he's dedicating himself to uh, becoming a serious sculptor I'm not saying he wasn't serious all along, but uh, when you hadn't got another job, you're a serious sculptor, Frank. Uh, so just hang in there. The uh, thing that amazes me, and I, I don't know about you all, but don't you just hate people who can do two or three things beautifully? <laughs> Frank, he can sing. Uh, he's a great painter. He's a great sculptor. Just a, a great individual. So, uh, Frank, you just come on. I'm not going to reveal any other secrets and let everybody know what you're doing. Uh, he has a PowerPoint. Uh, later on, we'll, have, we'll entertain questions if you have any questions. So uh, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Frank Murphy, a hometown boy made good. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Good morning. Good to see you here. How many people are from Sylacauga? A pretty good crew here who's part of Sylacauga. Where are some of the other people from? Just give me a little ballpark thing. Tuscaloosa. Tuscaloosa. Birmingham. Birmingham. Mobile. Mobile. That's a long way. Florida. Florida? Oh, Florida. So cool. Well, good. Good to have you here with us today, and uh, hope you enjoy this time together. And I promise to be out by 2 o'clock. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've got a ten dollar gift certificate I can give to somebody, but um, uh, I was not the original. I'm the replacement for the replacement for this uh, talk today, and so uh, what the original title was really didn't fit what uh, I 
have an experience in. So I'm just going to talk about being an artist. We've got some of our artists here. That, that's always intimidating to have other artists in the room, but glad to have you with us as well. Are you an artist? Anybody here? Do you want to be an artist? My college roommate, is, who is a potter in Gatlinburg, sent me this ad a few years ago from an old magazine. Be an artist. You'll get fame, wealth, beautiful lovers, a brief respite from your terror of dying. And then there's at the bottom, yes, I'd like to alter the course of cultural history. So if you want to do that, there is a post office box in Hohokus, New Jersey, that you can... Be an artist. Um, that is one point of view, maybe not a very high point of view of a calling to be an artist. You know, most artists do have a pretty good uh, uh, standing in the general public. I think because the the public generally sees them as having more gifts or talents, uh, or talents that are beyond the ordinary. So they're they're very appreciative of artists in that way. Uh, artists are thought to, to be more talented, more creative, and perhaps a little quirky as well. Tim Keller, uh, who is a pastor in New York, said in, in an essay, the essay is titled, Why We Need Artists. He, said, he tells a story of a group of, uh, of people who go backstage following a, uh, a great dancer's performance, and they approach the dancer and ask her, what did it mean? And she responded, if I could have said it, I wouldn't have had to dance it. <laughs> Art in some instances, or in a sense, has to be indefinable. Uh, it's what we do when words are incomplete or insufficient. Keller, he, he writes, he says, Art, uh, he sees art as the extension of how we try to praise God to express the indefinable glory Without art, Keller writes, it's almost impossible to praise God because we have no means by which to get the praise out. In another sense, art is the means of getting out the meaning of life. Other animals do not do art. They don't express their lives in terms of meaning and purpose. But we humans do, and we do it best when we express it through the forms of art, poetry, literature, dance, music, the visual arts. Humans have a need to, to help others see what they see and know. We want to, to express that to others. Rembrandt might have written a book or essay to describe the evolution of his life from a young man to an old man, but he has chosen through images of himself to tell us about who he was and who he is. And we see those expressions in his eyes in various stages of his life, the highs and lows, the successes and the failures, the confidence, and then also the pain. And there's so much more we could see in these paintings to describe who he is. A picture does paint. Well, that's my dance picture, isn't it? I'm on the wrong picture, sorry. Now we'll go back to that. Uh, a picture does paint a thousand words, but the words need not be spoken in response to the image. The images themselves speak much more than we can say in words. Art is said to be creative, and artists are creative. It's a word often associated with what we do, but according to Leonardo da Vinci, it's the wrong word. Creative is the wrong word. He wrote, man does not create, only God creates, man regenerates. Leonardo, though not a, a theologian, uh, spoke to the truth of what artists do. He says, only God can take nothing and create something. What mankind does is take the things that we have seen and held and heard and experienced and remake them into a form that we can understand and that expresses something about what we have discovered in a, in a new way. We gather together the materials and the truths 
and the beauty we know and regenerate those things to speak to a new age and to a new time. Our taste may vary in what we, uh, we speak or what we like. Perhaps you prefer the realism of a Bernini sculpture, or maybe you're more interested in Henry Moore's abstract, pain, uh, abstract sculpture, all this in marble. Or perhaps you're interested in abstract paintings like Pollock and Picasso. Or maybe you prefer the impressionism of Camille Pissarro or more realism of Camille Corot in these two pictures. But the best art seeks to express beauty or truth or the gamut of emotions that we experience. Sometimes it's in the form itself. Other times it's in the mystery of what it says. But art brings us to the table to be enlightened and to enlighten others. I don't know if I woke up one day as a child and said, I'm going to be an artist. Uh, what I did realize early is that I, I had a gift to see the way we understand or the way we see the world, and I could put it down in a form that had a certain accuracy about what we see in the world. I, in other words, I, I could draw what, I, what we see. Other kids my age and teachers affirmed me and, and said, draw me this, draw me that. I always drove eagles and cowboys and horses. And I admit there is a, something heady about being uh, given this kind of attention and, and this affirmation. Uh, it's hard not to feel good about yourself if everybody around you is telling you these things or recognizes your unique gift. In the movie Stand By Me, the four boys are on their way to see a dead body. If you've seen the movie, you know what I'm talking about. And they get slightly separated. Vern and Teddy, the two more immature of the boys, kind of get straggling behind uh, Chris and Gordy. Who, and what they're talking about is shown in the movie. Vern and Teddy are talking about who's more powerful, Superman or Mighty Mouse. Chris and Gordy are talking about their fears of going into junior high school. Chris is telling Gordy how, how smart Gordy is, and he is embarrassed by it. And he says, and, and Chris is telling Gordy, You're, you can be such a great writer because you tell such great stories. But Gordy tries to say it's not important, even says it's stupid. He's embarrassed to be so smart. But finally, Chris just looks sternly at him and, and, and says, you are crazy. It's like God came down and gave you this special gift and says, here it is, buddy. This is what I've got for you. Don't mess it up. And I think that's the responsibility that we all have about what we've been given in our life, to be what we can be and to express things in the way that we can and to share with fellow humanity. For artists, it's recognizing those kind of special gifts that we have to see the world in, un in unique ways and finding the avenues to express it. One summer when, when I, was, uh, I was about nine years old, a bunch of college students, they used to do this a lot back then, came through Sylacauga and they were selling big family Bibles. Big Bibles. You may have bought one. My, my, my mom and dad bought one of these big coffee table Bibles. In the Bible, there was a treasure chest of old paintings, of religious paintings of various kinds. There was uh, the traditional Karl Block paintings that were very accurately uh, descriptive kind of paintings, and you, if you may have seen them or, or not. But somewhere in the middle of that book, in the Old Testament section, there was a painting by Rembrandt. I'd heard of Rembrandt. I didn't know what he did, but I knew he was an artist, so I'd heard of him. And in this painting, it's a painting called Jeremiah Weeping Over the Destruction of Jerusalem. I couldn't take my eyes off this painting. I would sit and stare at the weary and worn prophet and wonder. I wondered first at the sheer artistic ability of Rembrandt to paint this man in this scene. Then I wondered at the way he painted the, the cloth and the, and the little container, the, the little bowl that he has there and, and the jewels that are a part of it. I wondered at that. And then I wondered at last and pondered 
what was going on in Jeremiah's head. I've never gotten over that picture. In fact, I have it. It's over my, it sends over my mantle in my house uh, today. I'd never seen such an expression so fully and abundantly made clear that, that Rembrandt did in, in this particular one. It truly it defies words. Words would be so impractical and insufficient to describe what I see there. That's when I knew I wanted to paint. And even now, I, I've seen paintings by Michelangelo, by Titian, Picasso, Van Gogh, Norman Rockwell, all these painters, and they, when I see their work, it inspires me to go out and paint. I want to paint. Then I go see Rembrandt, so I think, I quit, I give up. I can't do it. Uh, he, he's that good. But in spite of my inadequacy in front of Rembrandt, I, I wanted to be a painter if... I couldn't be a baseball pitcher. That's what I really wanted to do. Larry back there will know that's what I really wanted to do. It was what, but these are the things that I had been exposed to in childhood, you know, and, and so I drew constantly on a notebook. These are some of the oldest drawings I have. Some of y'all saw these when I was here a couple of years ago uh, on notebook paper in school and class or memograph sheets that the teacher handed out that had a test or something that I was supposed to have known on the other side. But I drew what I knew. I knew I liked sports, and so I did that. And I drew baseball players, and I drew football players, and I drew basketball players. I don't know how well you can see all of those, but I drew those things. And so I became very confident at drawing the human figure because I did it all the time, and I drew these things uh, constantly because that's what I knew best. Uh, I had a few opportunities to be exposed to sculpture growing up in Sylacauga. Some of you have heard this story. I had always wondered why there were no sculptures around Sylacauga. Uh, that I grew up in, there really was, other than the cemetery, there really wasn't any marble sculpture anywhere around the, the town. One day my dad had gone out to the quarry and just picked up some small pieces of marble that were lying on the side of the road. Some of you know about that and probably done it too and brought them home, and there was one piece, and I got it, and I got a claw hammer, and I got a wood chisel, and I started hammering away on that piece of marble, and it was a light piece. It was, it was too light, really, for me. I needed, I needed some way to hold it down, because every time I'd hit it, I was chasing it around, and finally, I just gave up on the wood chisel and just started beating it with the hammer, until I finally got something I thought looked, okay, I see something in there, finally, and so I pulled it up, and this is what it looked like. This is the, this is the actual piece right here. And so I took it, and I, and I got some oil paint from one of those paint-by-number kits that you had way back in the day, and painted one side, and I gave it to my dad for Christmas. And so everybody wanted to have a, a picture of Abraham Lincoln in marble, <laughs> and so I, I, I knew that's what he wanted for Christmas that year, and that's what I gave him. So I still have it because they kept it. They must have thought it was worth something to them. But I had, I had done that piece. That's my first marble piece right there. Now I have it at my house. I started off as an art major in college at the University of Montevallo, but I, I really struggled. I struggled in the classes because I really, I never had an art class. We didn't have art, any art classes at the high school at the time. I didn't understand what they wanted me to do, and I didn't understand the terminology, and I was too afraid to ask uh, because everybody else seemed like they knew what was going on. And... Uh, I didn't understand what they wanted me to do, and I didn't understand anything that they were saying. Besides that, art majors are weird. <laughs> and I was simply out of my element. And so I decided to change degrees to something that I knew, uh, physical education. I promised myself that I, I would get back to painting one day, that I would, I would do that, and I have to admit that I have never been able to escape uh, that, uh, that promise. But nothing I did I thought was very good. In my first job after college, I was a minister of recreation in a church, and I hired a retired professor of art to come and teach painting classes to a group of adults in the church who wanted to, to learn. And, and I decided to take the course as well. And, and, I, and I learned through that professor that there was much more that went into the making of a painting than just grabbing a canvas and brushes and, a, and, a, and paints. Along with the lessons, 
that he taught me in that class. I was given a book by a, a member of the church by Norman Rockwell describing how he painted one of his Saturday evening post covers. He went into elaborate detail about the way, the process, and, how, and, and what he did, and I realized that I hadn't done any of those things. I hadn't put any time or thought or effort or work into anything I was doing. So I decided I was going to try to paint one using the kind of work ethic that Rockwell used in his painting, and, and it transformed my work. This painting I did, no, that's Rockwell, that's, he did that. <laughs> I didn't do that, Rockwell did that. That's the book that I had. Uh, this is the painting I did before. This is what I did just four years later. A lot of, lot of difference in the level of competence there. It was in me all the time to do this, because I could, I, you saw the drawings, I could do them even as a, as a youth, but I had not done the work. It's about work. Being an artist requires work and diligence and, and commitment, and, and, it, and it's about excellence. It's not about just whipping things out. It's not uh, the idea of, can I sell it or is it marketable? Uh, it's, it's about having something to say whether that meaning or that message is about beauty or truth or the human condition or our relationship with the Almighty, it's, it's those things that bring our art up to the level that it needs to be. Most of my adult life, I have been balancing uh, my ministry with being an artist. Uh, and some of my best work began after I came to First Baptist Church in Rome. This was the first large piece I did that's I think about nine foot wide. It's been, and then I did this uh, Last Supper piece that I think First Baptist has maybe a print of this there. Uh, that, and then there's some detail of it. And this is another large, large piece. And uh, a, this one of Abraham Lincoln is here in Silicago. It's at the library, uh, not the library, it's the museum. You got to walk up the, the stairs, upstairs, and then come back down. When you come back down the stairs, you'll see it right there of Abraham Lincoln. Better, better than this one of Abraham Lincoln, at least. So. Um, and so these are some of the pictures that I did. The, this one is at First Baptist in Rome that I did when I, when I left there. Um, I took a job as a campus minister at a junior college, Georgia Highlands College, before I went to Berry College and did both of those campuses. But I, cause I, I took the job because I, I was offered the opportunity to work as a painter as well as a minister, it was a part. It was considered part time, so I was able to do both my artwork and uh, to do the ministry as well uh, as I needed to do that. Uh, it gave me a great opportunity to work through some things. So I'm going to just show a few of these. It's a prodigal son painting that I did, and you can see the you can see the Rembrandt kind of influence on on this. And then if you know his. His prodigal son painting, you, you'll know that there's some similarities. These are several pieces. Oh, okay, that's where I stopped. Okay. Um, no, 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 I can go through this. This, this was done. This is a, a painting that I did for the Georgia Baptist Convention in Atlanta. That's me standing on that scaffolding there. That, that painting is 44 foot long by 28 foot wide. And there's like 70 people, people's faces from, from various countries from where they are located in the painting. That's where they're, they're from, basically. So um, that took me a, a little over a year to do. That, and I had one other. This, this was the small, uh, this was another s ceiling in the same building. Um, it was a 21-foot circle. It was, the, uh, it was the separation of dark and light. Uh, and God pushing back the darkness. You have to, you've got to twist your head around. I probably should turn one the other way so that you could see, see it upside down. But, um, but there's, there's, a, there's different images from which, whichever way you're standing in front of it. I thought, well, it's a circle, so there's no place at the top or the bottom because you're looking up, so you should be able to see something regardless of the point of view that you're at. So that, that's kind of what is going on here in that particular painting. And then that's the, that's the finished one after I'd finished the, uh, whatever I was working on in that last part. So. 
these are some of just the, the individual figures that were in that uh, painting in various places in China and Africa and India and Pakistan, I believe. And then I've actually, I had to do six wall paintings as well in the room, and this is one of the six. Uh, it was uh, based on the uh, verse, you shall be witness unto me both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost part of the world. And this was considered the uttermost part because you can see Africa with the Egyptians you can, and, and some of the uh, places, Paris, uh, the cross there, that's from uh, Brazil, and of course the Taj Mahal and the Sydney Opera House and part of the Wall of China. And then this is Lake, uh, excuse me, not Lake, uh, Victoria Falls in uh, Zimbab Zimbabwe and, uh, and uh, Namibia, I think. I forget which part, but that's... Or, so places that would be considered far away for all of us, but that's one of my dear. Okay, yeah. I first got started seriously in sculpture in the early 1990s when I walked into an art store in Birmingham and I was going to buy paints and I saw a set of five stone carving tools with a little small hammer. I still have the hammer with my stuff. Uh, and, and I thought, man, I'm buying this right now. I think it was about $45. Said, I'm buying this because I know where I get the marble. I mean, I'd worked at the quarry when I was a teenager one time, so I knew that it was marvel to be got. And so uh, I didn't know what the tools did or how they, how they were supposed to be used, but I went to Berry College, found a book on stone carving, and it described each tool and what it was supposed to be used for, and, 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 I, and I started working on that. The piece on the left is the first piece that I, that I ever did. Uh, the old man, that's the fourth nose, because I broke three noses off before I got that one to stay. You, you, trial and error is a good way to learn, and I learned a lot. You know, you can't hit straight into the nose if you think you want it to stay on. So these kind of things you learn as, as you do it. And so I did that. And then this was the second piece on the right that I did. I, I feel like it was a step up for that. And I did four or five other stone pieces as well as some bronze in the next uh, 10 to 15 years until I came to, to 2011 when I heard about the, the Marble Festival. One of my good friends in high school told me about it. My mom failed to tell me about it. I uh, don't know why she didn't want me to know, but she did. Uh, but uh, Doug Pope told me about it, and, and I came here, and, and the festival has been a real treasure for me. It's not, it's not a competition. It's, it's more of an exhibition of what can be done with marble, uh, this great natural resource that we have here in Sylacauga. It's also an educational festival because we learn from one another. All of these artists back here, we learn from one another and, and we share kind of the ideas that we're trying to do and how we're trying to do them. And, and we, we work with the new tools and things that we haven't used before. And we learn, learn new methods uh, to, to work in the marble, and, and all these things um, helps us as, as artists to, to approach the stone in a new way, and, and it's uh, something that uh, we, we know that this is an educational thing, and I hope that when, the, when folks come through here, it's also an educational thing as you learn more about this, this great uh, natural resource that's here. And, and, uh, people always are expressing their amazement at what's here, and, and they ne never knew it was here, and, but it is. And so this has been a great festival to be a part of. I'm, I'm just going to show a few other slides of things that I've done. This, these are a couple of bronzes, one at, at Shorter University in Rome, and the other is uh, of Laocoon on the right. It's an it's a ancient Greek sculpture, and it's kind of my version, it's kind of a short version of the big one that they have at the Vatican. This is a modern telling of uh, Jesus at the house of Mar uh, St. Matthew. So it's called Party at Matthew's. So and they were all getting together there. This painting I did for the First Baptist Church of Dalton, George. I actually did eight paintings for them uh, on the series that they had. This was in the main uh, foyer as you entered the sanctuary. It's of the uh, Supper of Emmaus, where Jesus reveals who he is to two disciples. And they told me before they, 
I, I did the painting that that table was going to go there and it was going to be uh, right in front of it. So I just painted my table to match that table. And the, the thing I didn't anticipate that happened was the reflection of like the bowl of fruit in the front of the table is was reflected on the actual table. So it's all, almost like it just kind of enters into the to the painting that way. So uh, that was that was kind of neat to be able to 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 do that and, and to have that. I do a few little landscapes, and this is not a little one. This is like nine foot long of the uh, Monument Valley in uh, Arizona and Utah. And then here's another one of of uh, the great the Grand Canyon is is titled as beautiful as advertised and uh, you know everywhere I go and watch see beautiful scenery I, I would I would see a McDonald's sign and everything I was doing so I finally decided there ought to be one down in the canyon then I put a couple of other folks who have messed with our environment too to to be a part of that as well and then I have some sculptures uh, the one on the far right, I, I started here, and it, I think I had it here one year in the in the show. The others uh, was just marble I got from here, but they they were well. The one in the middle was in the exhibition at one time. So, so then there's some more here, a couple of others. The one in the middle was at the exhibition one year, and, and the one on the right too. I've never brought the one on the left. It, I started it here, but I just never. It's so big and heavy. I just thought, well, I just don't want to bring it. So don't have to, but it's called uh, torso leaping. Even though there's no legs, I wanted to make it look like he was jumping, so <coughs> kind of hard to do. But I, and the one in the middle is um, the ghost of Jacob Marley, and it's one of my favorite pieces that I've done. Uh, during COVID, uh, one of my friends asked me, "Could I could I just see a picture of Jesus laughing?" It was in the middle of the things were just at its worst. It was in April. 2020 and she said I want you to paint me a picture of Jesus laughing I didn't want it to be in I decided I, well I didn't want him just a big big smile on his face I wanted him to be busting a gut laughing at something so you know I, and so that's what I did I so I, I hope I kind of got that kind of point of view that that he is laughing there so it's really hard then the, this piece I also did at the festival the second year I was here a pieta Mary holding crucified Jesus. Here we are the week before Easter, and so I think this piece has special meaning. It's, it's, it's at First Baptist Church in, in um, Rome now. But what, what I didn't anticipate when I carved it was the grain in the piece. And if you look at the face of Mary, it's, it's almost like tears rolling down her face, and it. And that was something I didn't plan. It just was there. And uh, sometimes you're just glad to be a part of the process, not even when you don't know. That that piece is in First Baptist Church of Rome, where they have a courtyard. It's in that in their courtyard. So that's what I've been working on. That's what being an artist has meant to me. So I'm going to kind of leave it to you. If you got any questions, you need to ask me about this or anything that that I've got. Charles, do you uh, draw? I, I will look for models sometimes if I see somebody that I think would be a good model for, for things. That, Larry, yep, there you go. I see you back volunteering back there. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll find somebody when I'm working on that. The, the one early on of the, uh, the woman caught in adultery was a, uh, was a friend of mine, and so I, uh, she, she was my model for that, and I'll find different people for different things. Even that laughing Jesus, I looked through a bunch of pictures of people really laughing to, to, to just try to see what does your face do when you're really laughing, you know? How, how does your teeth go and how does the, your face draw up and how, you know, kind of squinches your eyes and things like that? So I'll do, do those things too as well as find people. So. And, I, and I have to also say the one art class, if you want that I had in high school was Mr. Fraser's mechanical drawing class. 
It was the only time, it was the only respite I had in all my time at, at Silicon when I got to go to his class and, and do mechanical drawing. I still have my board. Now, it's all messed up and broken, but it's but I still have it. I don't know if I have I still have some of the compasses somewhere. So but if Mr. Fraser was part of that, I see that hand. Do you have a favorite <laughs> Whichever one I'm working in, you know. <laughs> Whichever, you know, I, I love them both. Right now I am doing more sculpture, certainly more time. I think it takes more time to do the sculpture for one. So you just spend more time. Oh, I, what I usually say is I paint, I, I sculpted by day and paint by night, and so I, I can get, get them both done it's on the same day. But, you know, if I have a big project in one or the other, that's what usually gets me excited. So I've, I've got an idea for a, for a painting project on the Old Testament story of, of Joseph and his brothers, and I've got it drawn. I just got to get started on it, and it's, I, I want it to be big, but I'm th thinking, well, where am I going to put this? Who's going to want this? But so uh, that's that's something I, I so when I have a big project and I'm excited about it, I, I like to do that. Whatever it is, so. James, I see your name. Yeah. Yeah. What what I usually do, I I, I do kind of what we'd call thumbnail kind of size sketches and put everything kind of, I don't even have border on it yet. I draw it, and then I figure out what the border is after I do it, and then I draw it on a small scale with a, with a pencil that's a very light lead so that you just, you know, you can see it, but it's not really heavy because if I need to make changes or erase, I, I'll have an easier time to do that. And then I'll draw it a little bit bigger maybe, and then after that, once I draw that second one kind of bigger where I can see a little bit more detail, and then, then I kind of get the board around it. Then I, if I was really going to draw it really big, then I will put, I will graph that drawing and make it into squares and then just duplicate my squares bigger. Like the one I've got of, of Joseph and his brothers, I've drawn it. I drew it first on a little, I drew on the back of a, a Sunday morning worship service. <laughs> Got to do something during church. But so, and then I... Then I drew it a little bit bigger on, on regular drawing paper. Now I've got, it, I've got it drawn 18 by 24, but I want it to be now just a lot bigger than that. So I'll have to draw it one more time to get it the actual size that it's going to be. Yeah. Have you ever come to the uh-oh? <laughs> Nobody who's ever sculpted has not come to an uh-oh moment. You reinvent what you're doing, you know. Anybody want to testify back there? <laughs> uh, yeah, you, I mean, sometimes you can. Sometimes it's uh, you just have to kind of move around it a little bit. If it breaks something off that you really needed, you may have to really redesign what it is that you're doing so that you can kind of fit it in. Or um, I've done, had some big time uh ohs. If you've been into the uh, um, room in here, the exhibition room, um, there's one there of Rebecca Luker that I did. It's a bust. It was originally the bust for Geneva Mercer, the sculpture that's out in the little foyer area where the television is. Uh, I was in the middle of it. I had already finished her face and her hair, and I was working on her neck, and I hit the side, and I turned to look over here at something. I turned back. And the entire neck had broke. It had cracked completely all the way around. The, the, and I, I think what it was, the hair was, she had her hair in a bun, and the hair was so heavy, you know, unlike people's hair, it was marble, so it was so heavy, it just shook it, and it just popped. And it just popped off. And so I had to start over. I had to get a whole other piece of marble to do Geneva Mercer's uh, sculpture. But I, it sat there for two years, and I thought, I've got to do something with this thing. And so... I finally worked out this this idea for uh, with Rebecca Luker's face in there, and so you, if you go into it, you can see where on the neck that it cracked. But if you were to try to feel it, you'd never know it. You'd never know it. It's it's just slick. You just run your hand right over it. You'd never know it. But you can see it a little bit there on certain parts of it. So, uh oh, moments happen all the time, you know. And and sometimes we can fix them. Sometimes we can glue them. <laughs> I, I, actually, I. That thing has metal rods through it, and I glued it on top of that and kind of redid the whole thing. It totally transformed. I had to basically cut the face off. I had to break her nose off and 
just had that kind of shell of where the face was when I when I went back to do it again. So, yeah. yes. Well, bronze is done. You can either use uh, wax or you can use clay, and you and it's and it's done in that form first, and then you have to build a mold for that a, a, a plaster mold. Uh, and, and, and there are other ways you can also have a like a silicon kind of mold, and then then the lost wax method that it, it's the wax is still in there in the mold, and when you pour this hot bronze, the wax just melts and ball, boils up. And so it, it's a it's a more of a three or four step process. The easy thing about bronze is that you, you're doing working in clay or wax. You can add something back on. Anything breaks off, you can put it back on, and you, it'll always come. You can always put it back, and so that original sculpture can be uh, already there. Um, your hard part and, the, and your danger part is when you go to doing it in bronze. If you if you're doing this only one mold and it's that lost wax method, you if it, if it messes up, then you've lost your whole piece. You know it's gone. So things like that. So, but but the, it, it's easier to work with because unlike marble, you can add it back on at any time. So. Where do you get your pieces of marble, and do you get a piece of marble and decide what you're going to do? Or do you decide what you're going to sculpt and then find a piece of marble to match it? Uh, we got about four people in here who could answer that question. Robert could answer that. Or uh, what do y'all do? Y'all are y'all uh, y'all rather see it in it, or do you come prepared for something? I was just lucky or fortunate, yeah. But I like to, I like to find rocks that are unusual shape and unusual color. Yeah. If I buy a block of stone, I had them six or seven years and I look at them, they don't suggest anything. Yeah. And then so one day, voila, yeah. Anybody else back in on these other guys? Larry? <laughs> Oh yeah, there's a number of female who are there. Yeah, yeah, we've got bunches of them. Linda Walden has been coming for years here. Uh, we've got a bunch of pa Pamela Payne been coming for years. Jane Jaskovich used to be here all the time, but she moved, and so she's she's not here. Um, Karen Terhoon is here. I was trying to think who else. Ted probably know who they are better than I would. Who? Jennifer, it's just her first year, yeah, and and uh, so we we yeah. Uh, that's true. That's right. We have uh, Elena. What was her? The one if you go out there and you see it, it's, it's a hand. It's really great looking hand. It's got a lot of veins popping in it, and that's her. She, she did as part of the the festival here, and then there's another one. It's a uh, it's more of a relief painting that the other sculptor did a few years before that. And, uh, yeah, so we have those. Uh, to go back to your question, I, I sometimes come with a, an idea of what I want to do, and I'll sometimes have a clay, little small clay version of it so that I'm, if I find what I'm looking for marble-wise, that I'll do that. But I have changed my mind. One last year was going to be something totally different, and it ended up Moses and the baby, so... I'm glad I, I'm glad it changed. Rudy. Right. You, sometimes I think carving should be called a grinding festival. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like it does. Trump addressed that. You know, someone's got a grinder one end and air hammer the other. <laughs> but you, you were basically tapping with the chisel and, and an outlet. Right? Well, it was what I knew. When I came here, the first time I had, when I first came, uh, I'd only used a, a hammer and chisel. That's all I'd ever used on any of the pieces that I'd done. So I, I wasn't even familiar with what was used. And that's why it was such an educational thing for me to come and see things like an angle grinder. I have an angle grinder, and I use it quite a bit, but most people don't see it. 
when people come from other places, they want to take a picture of me, I pull out the hammer because I know that's what they want to see me doing. <laughs> they don't want to see me grind. Everybody's doing that, so I pull out the hammer and let them see that. Um, and, but, you know, uh, I, love, I love the feel of having a hammer in the hand. I feel like i got more control, especially if I'm doing detail. So I always feel like that's, that's, that's very important towards the end of the process uh, and uh, having that. And um, uh, yeah, I, I enjoy the physicality of it. And um, so that, that's kind of part of my life. But I do, I do like to have my angle grinder close by because sometimes you just got to cut something off. And, Tell the story of, of Moses <coughs> and the baby and how you had to use the mirror. That oh, <laughs> yeah, I forgot it. about that, yeah. Um, well, when I was when I was doing the, the piece that's in there of of, of Mary and, and um, Moses, not it's not Mary, it's not yes. Mary. <laughs> Where did I get that? It's a, it's Pharaoh's daughter, and, and she's looking down. And I'd already carved pretty much what her face looked like when I was working on the baby, and you know, the baby was is faced the other way, and so her, she's the daughter's leaning over, and her head's going to be here. So I have to cut out here, and I can cut a little bit here with just the chisels and angle grinder. But when I got down to this part, my chisel wouldn't fit down in there, and I had I had to use the uh, uh, a carbide tool on my uh, Dremel to get and cut around the chin and some of the cheek area. But then to do the detail, I, I didn't trust myself with that Dremel, so I wanted to carve it. And the only way I could do it was to, I said, I could stuck a mirror up on Mary's chin and carved it looking in the mirror so that I could get it where it was supposed to be because I just, there was the only way I could get to it that was that way. So, uh, so that way yeah, I had to think, all right, you're, you're looking at that. It's got to go. You have to think which way it's supposed to go that way. But I had, you know, I, I could get in there with a pencil and draw it. So I had the line there. So it was just a matter of, you know, just taking my time, like cutting around the eyes and, and the nose and those kind of things. But, but yeah, I did use a mirror for that. I forgot about, about that. The baby's face is beautiful. I, I, that's, I love the baby's face best of all. I do that. Most people don't want to answer this question. I'm a layman. What do you think about postpartum? That's a good question. But, uh, besides just the whiteness, the pure whiteness that most of it is, it's the fine crystal. Uh, grade that it is it, and what that means is that you can put more detail into something if you see a piece um, there's, I think Bill Cook's got a piece in there of Georgia marble of a horse and you can see how big the crystals are in it and that he had to kind of be more general in the detail he couldn't be as specific I've tried to carve flowers with the, some of the larger crystal marble from other places and it just breaks off in ways you don't expect or larger ways. So the, the really great thing is the fineness of the crystal uh, level in that. Some of the other artists may have some other ideas on that as well. But that's, that's one of the things that I really like about it. Well, uh, I, what I've heard, and I, I'm, I, I've not carved any Carrara. Anybody here carved any Carrara? Larry, James has, you have? Uh, any, any difference? Or she's done this? Uh, you know, Carrara marble is up on a mountain, and so there's a different kind of pressure on it than the marble here, which is down in a valley, or down under the ground. So the, there's more pressure on the marble here by the earth around it. So I think it changes some of the the consistency of it because of that as well. So. Robert. 
That's right. That goes, that goes eight dollars right there. <laughs> Be grabbing it up and saving it, you know. <laughs> I know the feeling. <laughs> All right. I think that, thank you all for letting me be here today and for your attention. And if you hadn't been out there, go out there and see what we're doing. <laughs>